going to introduce uh, my colleagues one by one uh, so we can go through their bios and then we'll, we'll get a conversation going uh, very quickly. But first of all, please uh, welcome uh, Roberto Alvarez. He's the executive director at the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils, a network of organizations that work to accelerate global competitiveness and prosperity. Uh, Dr. Alvarez is an expert in international development and innovation and a research scholar at Arizona State University. Uh, Michael Fung, please welcome Michael. He's the Deputy Chief Executive for Industry at Skills Future in Singapore. Uh, he's also the President of the Higher Education Planning in Asia Association. He's an Adjunct Senior Fellow at the Singapore University of Technology and Design, and he was a Senior Advisor to the Office of the President uh, of Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Next, we have uh, Marcelo Kegligian, who is the uh, digital analytics uh, lead, uh, cyber and innovation uh, for um, uh, Ernst & Young. Sorry, I haven't got your, uh, your bio there, uh, Marcelo. Can I just say, uh, Marcelo has actually joined us from uh, Dubai. So he is uh, an embodiment of the spirit of collaboration and cooperation. So thank you very much for coming over from Dubai, Marcelo. And uh, finally, and last but not least, Leslie Thompson. She is the Vice President, uh, Academic and Government uh, Strategic Alliances uh, in the UK for Elsevier. Uh, prior to joining Elsevier, Leslie uh, was, uh, worked for 26 years at the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Uh, she rose to the position of Research Director with responsibility for the strategy and delivery of the scientific program with an annual budget of 800 million pounds. Uh, she's a great champion of early career researchers, interdisciplinary research and diversity, and she's a member of the Royal Society's diversity group. Uh, she was also awarded in 2016 uh, an MBA for services to research. So we have a, a, an excellent panel. We only have an hour, uh, so we're gonna keep this uh, as conversational as possible. Uh, please very much uh, join in on Slido, and we'll be going out to the audience to ask questions uh, very soon. But I think I just, I've, I've read the bios. It's important that we know who our panelists are, but I'd like to really get a sense of, of who they are as people um, and ask them to introduce themselves to you and introduce their role, their work, their activities, and how it relates to the panel. So perhaps, um, Roberto, if we could start with you, please, please let us know who you are. Thank you, Phil. I think that he can hear me now. Yeah. That's a very complex question. Um, <laughs> let's say uh, my shrink has not answered that for several <laughs> years. Yeah. But uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I think it's, it's, it's hard to have someone better to start this conversation as we had Minister Ol Jabber this morning. This whole concept of transformation, I think it's really reshaping not just the game for business, but for universities, right? And you said that we'll have one hour here. In this one very hour, we'll have 10,000 new inhabitants coming to this planet. Not just being born, but we are adding that to the population. 36% of them are coming from Africa, 18% coming from India. That's a massive demand for higher education and for your organizations. We heard today about technology transformation and how that is reshaping business, right? And it's in that context that my organization comes to the arena based on the understanding that universities are the economic growth engines of the knowledge economy. The GFCC, the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils, it's a multi-stakeholder organization. We are based in the United States, represented on the ground in 35 different nations. Our members are government agencies, mostly involved in economic development, innovation, research, like Qatar Foundation, the Government of Australia, Japan Science and Technology. A second group, private sector, industry chambers, competitiveness councils that want to move forward their economies, and because of that, they need more and more knowledge to support innovation and competitiveness, corporations and universities. So my background really comes from this multi-stakeholder setting. And all of them are really concerned about creating economic value. That is, 
The big question is how to turn knowledge into economic value. What are the process? What are the barriers? What can be done in that context? Back in 2016, we launched something that is the GFCC Universal Research Leadership Forum. It's chaired by the Chancellor of the University of California, San Diego. We have around 45 universities coming from 20 different nations. We're not talking research or education per se, but really innovation. How universities engage with local startup communities, corporations, government labs, really to create economic value. So this is the background. Back on me, so I, I normally say that I'm a, a fallen engineer. I'm an engineer by training. I've worked a bit in business and government, and now uh, working in the GFCC. And just to finish this part, Phil, um, I'll tell something very, very short, a conversation that I had with one of our university members down in Latin America. We were together um, in a third country, and we, we had a conversation on cities. And this university that's a private sector university in Latin America, and I think this connects in some way to the conversation that we had yesterday and what our colleague from Colombia mentioned, this diversity in the environment. Public funded, private sector, different types of universities coming together. And we, we were talking cities and innovation and smart cities. And when we finished that, he came to me and said, hey, that was a great conversation, I really enjoyed because our university in our country has one of the most successful tech parks. But it's pretty clear that we will fail as a university in the years to come, in the decades to come, if we don't find a way of transforming themselves and mingling ourselves, mixing ourselves with the city, becoming more than a knowledge provider, but really an organization that's connecting the dots with different stakeholders in that ecosystem. The second part of that conversation was um, that a year later, I went to that university and we hosted a workshop with three university presidents and the mayor of that city in Latin America, one of the main cities in Latin America. And I asked them a question, a question that maybe it will not make sense to you, but, or to most of you, but it, it surely does in Latin America. And I asked them, who of you in this room know someone in this city, multi-million city from India? We had 200 participants in the, in the audience. Nobody raised their hands. So the message here, things that we've been seeing, first, local relevance. Second, the importance of global connectivity. In order to turn knowledge into economic value, you need to think in a global scale. You need connections to the world, not just to create knowledge, but to turn that into new businesses and new ventures. Thank you. That's a, a, a great intro and given us already lots of food for, for further conversation. But let's quickly uh, move on to, to Michael. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Michael. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I used to work uh, in the university sector. Three years ago, I moved from Hong Kong to Singapore. I am now with uh, an organization called Skills Future Singapore under the Ministry of Education. And I'll talk a little bit more about the, the, my, you know, the scope of what we're trying to do there. Uh, but during my time in uh, Hong Kong at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and prior to that at the uh, Singapore Management University, the question of how should the university work with industry and how do we motivate and uh, incentivize faculty to uh, be actively engaged in industry, that has always been a challenge. And I would, uh, I would argue that for universities that are research intensive, that's uh, particularly challenging because the research outputs that faculty are looking at uh, is somewhat different from the kind of research output that industry in general expects uh, to be delivered. So there's a, there's, a, there's a gap there. The other gap that we are seeing increasingly is the pace of uh, technology development, the pace of emerging skills that is needed by the industry. Uh, and here, there's another growing gap because uh, the curriculum that's delivered by the university is always playing catch up. And in rapidly emo uh, evolving skills areas like in ICT, uh, that's becoming a bigger and bigger struggle. And so, so that leads me into uh, talking a little bit about what we're trying to do at SkillsFuture, which is focus on workforce development. Upskilling and reskilling of the workforce so that the 
workers are able to stay relevant and stay gainfully employed as the economy shifts uh, and, and grows. Traditionally, the notion of worker training has been left largely to private sector uh, and you know, short courses, modular courses, uh, or uh, the workers could come back to the universities for regular, maybe part-time, but you know, semester-long or full, you know, full, uh, full-term uh, academic programs. Uh, but we've started working with the universities in Singapore over the last uh, two, started about two or three years ago. There's a big push into getting universities to be engaged on the teaching front uh, with what industries uh, needs. So uh, we we'll, we'll set the policies and we provide funding to all the uh, publicly funded universities for this aspect of the work. And we're starting to see a shift in the model. Uh, some of the uh, larger uh, local universities in Singapore are now thinking about an education model that's not, you know, it's not a three year or four year degree program, it's now a four plus 20 uh, program. So you get your degree in four years, but keep coming back for the next 20 years uh, for con continuing education. And so that's a shift that we're working on, uh, which, which looks at bridging the uh, training chasm that we think it's growing. Uh, I think I'll just leave it there, and then uh, we can use that as a context for further conversations on the panel. I think there's a lot of this conversation, I think, might focus on those, those gaps that you identify and, and also the skills needs, how skills needs are changing so we can deliver for industry and also industry can, uh, can receive the, the graduates that, that they need uh, for the fourth industrial revolution. Um, but let's, let's hand over to you, Marcelo, just for some brief, <coughs> brief introductions. Hopefully the mic will come through. Yeah. Do we have the mic on? Yeah. The man is running. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> Hello? No. I can hear you. You can hear me. <laughs> we can hear him fine. Hello? Uh, yeah. Yes, good. Excellent, thanks. So good afternoon again, uh, Marcelo Kiklesian. Uh, 50 years old, married with two children. Uh, Married with an Argentinian lady, being Brazilian, and this is relevant because we are going to talk about partnerships. And partnerships sometimes are not easy, right? <laughs> so being able to manage a Brazilian and Argentinian relationship, I think, brought me good experience on that as well. <laughs> the background, academic background, computer science, uh, started my career in back in 1986, uh, developing analytics at that time. So, you know, everybody believes big data is a new thing. I am proof that that's not true. The, the explosion of data, it's a true. It's di totally different than 1986, right? Today we have video, pictures, text, voice, everything that we can use uh, in terms of new technologies and advanced analytics as we heard in the morning, artificial intelligence, machine learning, to help us on businesses, right? So I, I am here today because I, I work for Ernest Young as leader of digital analytics, cyber, and innovation for the MENA region. I am based in Dubai. And the reason I'm here is because I am constantly working with all the sectors, and they have a lot of demand. And the demand that they have is about talent. And in this region, as well as in my previous experience in, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, in Latin America, as well as in Asia Pacific, in Indonesia, Vietnam, the request or the demand is the same. We need talent. And we need very specific, specialized talent that in those emerging markets, they don't exist. So I have some experience working with universities to develop, co-develop that talent, those talent that will be used in the industry later on. So I hope I can illustrate some of the cases to you later on. Thank you very much. And Leslie, let's, let's uh, hear a little bit more about you. Uh, you can talk about your marriage, if, if you like, or, or your, your relationships, whatever they may so be. So this wasn't planned, but <laughs> I'm British, married to a French Algerian. And I can, can testify that industrial academic relationships are marriages, and you have to be in it for the long haul. So um, in the 26 years while I worked for one of the UK's research councils, I saw the amount of collaboration on the portfolio that we have with business 
grow from 5% of the grants we funded to 54% of the grants we funded. Um, and during that time, I saw the quality of research that we were supporting grow also. For me, that was critically important that we worked with business and universities to demonstrate the value not of project funding, but of maintaining long-term relationships. Um, and some lessons came out of that. First, do your homework before you enter into a relationship. Nobody, maybe a Brazilian does, but most people don't enter into a marriage the first week they meet somebody. They do a long courtship and work out whether the relationships are appropriate. Um, having worked out the relationships appropriate, they then try to design a win-win situation. It's very easy for an industrialist to think they can go to a university to get short-term contract research done, or for a university to think the industry is just a cash cow. Those relationships just don't work. They're a one-night stand. If you want to build a long relationship, you need to Did I say something unpopular? You need, to, <laughs> you need to build an understanding between the partners, and that has to extend beyond the two people who are the initial contact. The deeper and the wider the relationship, the more resilient it will be. Um, one example, back in 2000, I went and talked to industry when I worked for a funder, and industry was saying they weren't able to recruit PhDs with the right skill sets. They wanted PhDs who could go deep, but were also very comfortable with doing team working. And so I went to my organization and said, could you please give me 10 million pounds over five years? I want to try establishing some centers in PhD training. I got money for two. Um, Oxford and Edinburgh came forward with brilliant ideas, as did five other research-led universities in the UK. So I went back and said, we've got something here. Can we have some more money? Um, in 2014, the UK government partnered with the research council I work for and gave us half a billion pounds to invest in centres for doctoral training, which was matched by a similar amount of money from UK industry. Um, and for all of us, universities or business, that's important because government needs to see this relationship working like that, so they bless it and keep investing in research. I'm passionate about that. I've now moved to Elsevier, where part of what I do is look for where we can build academic partnerships to meet our company's needs. So we have a massive growth in the need for data scientists, computer scientists, mathematicians. And we're based in London, where it's really hard for us to attract those sorts of skill sets. We've got Google and we've got Facebook around the corner. Um, so what I'm doing is trying to build relationships now with universities that understand our needs and can think about how we might work together. And so actually I'm delighted that now I've brought Elsevier into this centred approach to PhDs and when the UK government announce the outcome of the next funding round, Elsevier will be a partner in a number of centres. So I've come full circle in this. Um, and all I want to say is actually for emerging economies, there's one thing you have that's really important, and that's diversity. We are killing ourselves as a company because the heterogeneity of our workforce. We are desperately seeking a more diverse workforce because a more diverse workforce is more creative, has a greater imagination, and that will drive us where we want to go as a business. So I'd encourage all of you to look for win-wins, think about the marriage, and I think together industry and universities are stronger and governments will have the courage to back dollars from the taxpayer into research and development instead of the health service or military. And that, I think, is what unites us all here today. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, some really important examples there. So that actually leads very well onto the first question that actually William, I think, had posed uh, as, as chair. Um, so we've, we've got a couple of questions that the panel have, have considered in advance, but I do obviously want to encourage you all to ask questions as well. So do use Slido, and we'll, 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 we'll open up uh, with some mics later on. But it's interesting what you're saying, Leslie, about the, 
the real pros of engaging with emerging economies. The first question was, um, from an industry perspective, sort of what advantages come with working in emerging markets? Is there a first mover advantage there? What are the pros for, for industry in terms of working in, in uh, emerging economies as opposed to the more advanced economies? Should we go back to you, uh, Roberto, for, for a look at that issue? Okay. Um, is it just working? Yeah, okay. So, and just to complement what Marcelo and Leslie said, I'm Brazilian, married to a Portuguese, born in Africa, we live in the United States. So just, yeah. And um, it's, the, it's the living embodiment of this power of, of bringing diverse cultures and people together and, and also the challenges of, uh, <laughs> of overcoming these barriers to the cultural barriers and expectations. It's a, it's a wonderful panel for that, for that and, diversity. And in really feel this challenge of crossing the boundaries, I was, as was said in the previous panel, right? So industry, academia, government have different reports. When we first hosted our Universal Research Leadership Forum, and, and then we published a report, and the title for that report is Convergence and Circulation, with this notion that we need people who understand the different realities. We need people in academia who has worked in industry to understand how to connect. We need people in government who understands academia in order really to see what's the best way to use knowledge assets there and to engage. So this circulation of people, it's a key tool. And I can give you some concrete examples. For, for instance, universities that have industry internship, not for students, but for professors, yeah. in order to really to work in the industry for a period, to understand what is needed, what are the metrics, what's the language. So those, those are really some critical tools. And I would be happy to be back to, to this topic. But to your question, I think there are uh, three things that we can say about engaging with universities in emerging markets. The first is that, as you said, there's a global war on talent. There's a global dispute on talent. And that's spread worldwide. In the United States alone, there are 500,000 IT jobs that are not fulfilled. People are not there. Maybe they're in emerging markets. So first thing, you can tap into skills if you successfully connect with the universities in emerging markets. The second thing is, back to my example on Latin America and connections with India, and I'll tell you why I, I raised that question. And I posed the, that question to university leaders down in Latin America because that very university had developed a new technology for water purification. We have 750 million people that don't have access to clean water in, in the globe, and that really is connected to the, let's say, SDGs, et cetera. Where would you deploy that technology? If you don't have the connections, you don't know the people, you don't know the market, you don't know how to build a business, you don't know how to design a contract in the term sheets, you don't know how to raise funds in a faraway market. So global connections are essential for that. But the second aspect in terms of engaging with the universities in the emerging world, it's like that. There are technologies, there are knowledge pieces that are not creating the economic value they could. So if you, have, if you can successfully connect with the universities and in the emerging world, you can unlock value creation. And the third point that I think it's maybe more specific to the case of Latin America is that there is a separation between public and private sector. By law, in, in various cases, that's embedded in institutions. In order to allow for circulation, we need sometimes to change legal frameworks. That is essential. In most environments, in Latin America, for instance, universities cannot do what is done by universities in, in advanced nations, especially in the United States. They don't have the freedom to hire professors. They don't have the freedom to set salaries. They don't have the freedom to enter in contracts. So first thing, you need to understand those uh, legal barriers. You need maybe to re-engineer that. Thank you. And uh, Michael, do you want to tackle that? Obviously, Singapore is heavily dependent on an international uh, talent base. Um, is there a sense there that there are 
advantages to really focusing on partnerships with, with the developing world? Yeah, um, certainly so. Uh, let, me, let me just start by predicating that uh, there's an ongoing debate about the role of universities and society. Uh, but in, in my mind, um, universities are obligated to contribute and, and deliver value back to the society and the context they're set in. Because that's that's you know that's a, a big part of what the economy and the society needs from uh, from universities. Whether it's in creating new knowledge, uh, be it uh, transferring those knowledge into things that the industry can apply uh, to solve social problems and so on. So on that premise, um, uh, the the question would be: How could universities be more and more relevant to uh, what industry needs are, which is a, a good part of what. Uh, economies uh, about in, in all parts of the world. Uh, in a developed country like uh, Singapore, uh, we are facing uh, uh, a problem of falling birth rates, as in many developed countries. So Japan is facing the same problem, Hong Kong, uh, many of these uh, European countries. Uh, and when we think about talent pool in these developed countries, uh, it's, it's becoming quite, quite a problem. Uh, in the area of ICT, for example, that I, I'll come back to, there's a huge shortage of IT engineers, uh, data scientists, data analysts, uh, and that's going to hit. Uh, that's going to constrain the growth of not just the ICT industry, but all the other industries that are enabled by the use of ICT. So our view of some of these opportunities in emerging markets is many of the emerging markets have uh, uh, still uh, have healthy birth rates, and there are lots of young people, young people who are hungry. Uh, who are able to deliver value to, uh, to these uh, emerging fields with, uh, with the proper education and training. Uh, and so we have companies that are now moving in, out into the region, into uh, Malaysia, into Indonesia, not just in terms of exporting the, the products and services, but in terms of looking at how to engage with the uh, talent pool in those, in those uh, areas, in, in those regions. Uh, the other thing that I would also point out about uh, institutions in emerging markets is uh, for especially for younger institutions, I think there is an advantage because you are not encumbered by uh, traditions or, or a long history. Universities are uh, are slow moving uh, aircraft carriers. It takes a long time to steer the ship and, and turn it around. And so the struggles that we are seeing in established universities in developed uh, markets, developed countries, I think you might have an advantage of. Uh, uh, moving more quickly in emerging markets to attune uh, the universities to what industry needs are. Thank you. Let's move move straight on to you, Marcelo. Yeah. So maybe maybe I can maybe maybe I can uh, share with you some experiences that I had in both Latin and in Asia Pacific regarding talent, as we are talking about talent, because in the area that I I know of is data scientists, and we we heard this morning as well that that is a lot of competition against all of the enterprises to find those talents. Um, and once you find them, they are either very senior experienced and then they will produce right away. But when they get, we get them from college, from university, you know, there is a learning curve and the pace that the industry or the enterprise need sometimes is not there. So that was the challenge that uh, I faced uh, two times. I'm facing the same in the region, so I'm willing to partner with universities to, to solve that problem. But uh, with the University of, uh, of Sao Carlos in, in Sao Paulo, we came with a program that we will teach statisticians in company on the tools that we use to solve business problems in a, in a very well-structured course that took about three months. Of course, the company didn't have budget to get all the students, but we managed to get 50 of them through a lot of tests. It's funny because one day in the morning I got to my office, I saw a huge line of young people and I said, oh my God, what is happening here? But it was 300 students going for the test and we selected five, 50, 50 of them. Uh, they went to the program where my team and myself, we teach them. Because you know, when you think about the data, the data uh, knowledge or expertise that is needed is one thing that you know you, you need to learn on the field. That is a, what I call data mindset. You can learn the tools, but if you don't have the data mindset to to solve a business problem using that data mindset, 
it's, it takes time to learn. So of, of those 50 uh, students, we selected 25 that got their first job in that company that I was working with. It's, it's a famous company in Brazil, so my Brazilian colleagues will know. Their name was Serasa uh, Experian. It's a, a famous credit bureau in, in Brazil. So that was a very well-defined program that we, we imp exported to the whole LATAM, Argentina, Argentina, Colombia, Mexico. Uh, Vietnam is another example, but that was through open innovation. So we had a problem from one of our clients that they want to do, a telco client, uh, they want to do financial inclusion. They want to try to you know, create a digital banking. And the challenge there is like, how can you uh, define risk or calculate risk of people not paying a loan if you don't have no information? So that was given to several uh, schools, universities, and, and we selected the best solution and we engaged with, with the student in a very well-defined way. So that is, that is the experience I have. Thank you. And, and Leslie, I wonder whether I could ask you to reflect, sort of following on from that, that good example, the second question we posed was really looking at, well, it was framed as how do partnerships with industry help to secure a university's future against potential uh, and external threats and risks. But actually, I think that's a two-way street, isn't it? There's yes. a real sense that partnerships with universities can protect industries yeah. by keeping them yeah. relevant with talent, yeah. keeping them fresh with ideas. So yeah. could I ask you to reflect on that area, the, the, the way that these partnerships really future-proof institutions and, and businesses, and, and what kind of examples we can see of that? So th <coughs> I think the maturity of the word partnership as opposed to just seeing funding, is critically important here. It's no good seeing a short-term buck. Um, universities increasingly are going to have, to have more financial sources of funding rather than being critically dependent on a single source. And certainly for a company like ours, the one thing that is most critical to our success is our talent pool. And one of the things we're finding is actually some of our young tech guys really like the idea of going back to universities and mentoring and supporting or teaching software. So that enhances us, but also enhances their value. So I think moving forward, the word partnership and evaluating win-wins is much more important than just seeing as money sources. The more your staff are connected to a wider set of things rather than the corporate identity and just going in and coding this or that, the more likely you are to retain your staff. And the one thing that makes a difference to the bottom line in companies is keeping your talent, once you've got them trained, as long as possible, but keeping them fresh. And so we're just, with a university in the UK, going to go in and teach them on their software engineering course. Um, and actually for us, one of the paybacks we've got is our software engineering guys are saying, oh God, actually we've got to think back to how we do it in the company because they're not doing that in the university. So I think finding this mutual benefit makes both corporates and universities much more resilient. And I think universities have been there for a very long time. Most corporates have come and gone. Um, in anyone's, certainly in the last 100 years, it's hard to think of what corporates were there 100 years. Relationships with universities will make you more resilient. And I'm just wondering um, if we can take that back to you, Michael, in the sense we heard this morning from the, the former minister, uh, Hessa al Jaiba that a lot of students now believe that maybe they don't need a university education. There's also this sense that Big businesses perhaps are recruiting uh, smart young people at, at higher salaries than maybe early career research positions. You know, is there a challenge to the university? Leslie's made the, the very important point there, very resilient organizations, centuries old, but is there a sense that actually industry can get on perfectly well without, without these universities? They can provide the skills that they need through their own educational programs, they can offer R&D opportunities for, for young researchers and, and talented people without a university environment? Or do you feel from a government perspective that universities will play a fundamental role in, in that uh, um, shared relationship with the economy? 
Yeah, so I, I think um, from a policy making point of view, we see that the university industry linkage needs to uh, further deepen and strengthen, uh, both in terms of teaching as well as research. And we're not saying this, I mean, we'll always say this in uh, universities, right, that, that we work for, that you know, we establish these strong linkages, but I'll, I'll illustrate why it's so important. Uh, on the teaching front, uh, we've talked a little bit about ICT skills that's evolving so quickly. Um, I've heard from ICT companies if a if a, an IT engineer works on a project, uh, which may be like nine months or 18 months long, if that individual doesn't keep up to date with what's going on in the industry, by the time he or she finishes the project, he or she would not have the skills for the next project. That's, you know, that's remarkable and how, uh, in a way, pretty, uh, pretty scary to think about that. Uh, and consequently, when you look at universities, look at our faculty, they might be doing great research. They might be keeping at the forefront of particular fields. But the teaching, the capability of the teaching side of the house to keep up to date with these uh, uh, um, um, evolutions uh, uh, in terms of knowledge in the space, that's going to be, that is already quite challenging. It's going to be increasingly challenging. So what we have started doing is to look at how to further blend what we call uh, you know, classroom-based education with workplace learning and workplace training. We've launched a number of work learn programs somewhat modeled after apprenticeship systems in, uh, in Switzerland, Germany, somewhat modeled after co-ops uh, programs, but in our own unique blend that fits our, our context, where we're infusing a lot more workplace-based learning so that individuals, whether you're talking about undergraduates or mature workers coming back into the system, uh, so that they get a lot more uh, you know, uh, front leading edge uh, training in, in, in what's needed. Uh, the other aspect is industry is leading quite a bit, corporate labs and corporate research uh, outfits are leading in quite a number of areas like AI and so on. Now that challenge is then how do we bring that back uh, and fuse that with the strengths of the university? We haven't quite cracked that one. We're still thinking through that, that relationship, uh, but clearly that linkage needs to be strengthened uh, uh, going forward. And there's some great in, in uh, examples in, in Singapore, isn't there, where the universities are really starting to rethink how they deliver content uh, in specific relation to the needs of, of the economy, the needs of industry. So we were at the National University of Singapore for our World Summit back in September. And what did you, you call the model? It's four, four plus 20. They have a, a, a sort of 20-year relationship with their, with their alumni. Um, but do you want to just explain a little bit more about how universities in Singapore are reacting to the need to be yeah. more relevant to, to, to the economic needs? Yeah, so this, it's, it's a challenge. Universities, like I said, is slow moving and they're well established in, in, in traditional structures for a good reason. Uh, when we look at some of these quick, uh, what we call them emerging skills, you know, quickly evolving uh, space, uh, the, the challenge to us is how do we get universities to embrace and, and, and deliver on industry relevant training at scale I think business schools are quite accustomed to developing custom programs, EMBA programs for, for industry. But I'm talking about engineering, talking about all the other fields, uh, uh, could be in uh, supply chain management, in, in many, many different fields. How do we get, get that capacity growing? Uh, so despite the fact that government is providing funding to universities, the change management is not trivial. What we've seen amongst the universities in Singapore is they've actually established fairly distinct operations to pursue what we call continuing education and training, CET, uh, and, that, and then trying to draw the linkages back to faculty. Trying to grow that part of, that, of the university operations with existing faculty is challenging because incentive structures are not quite right. Uh, you, know, you need business development skills to engage industry. Uh, you need to uh, find the right lecturers with the industry knowledge. Um, so despite, you know, despite all these efforts, and, and I think we have some very uh, encouraging initial progress, uh, despite all these efforts, we're still finding challenges in some of the uh, really hot areas. Lack of uh, lecturers, lack of uh, teaching capacity for, for these fields. Um, uh, one particular area, if you're interested, you can look up uh, skills feature series, which is eight domains that we have identified as uh, quite critical emerging skills. And we have all our six universities as well as the uh, 
six uh, post-secondary education institutions, polytechnics, vocational education, uh, focus on delivering training in these uh, spaces. Uh, and that's where the industry partnership is very critical to design programs that are highly responsive to industry needs. Marcel, do, do you want to come on, on, in on that before I move on to another? Yeah, so, so I think that the, just to add a little bit is, you know, I think all the, the organizations uh, that works with me at EY, they are looking for pace fast, fast innovation, fast new ideas. And, and the, the challenge we have in the companies is we need to keep the business, the actual business as usual going. And sometimes to stop or to separate a people, a, a group of people to do those innovations, they, they are not feasible. And then that's the, the play that universities are playing, uh, working with us in, in MENA. Sure. Um, I just want to open up, uh, make sure that, that, that you have a chance to ask. There is a question on Slido, I have more, but if anyone wants to raise a hand and contribute at this point, please do. Uh, can we get a microphone to the front here? Uh, just the gentleman here at the front. Sorry, the mic's coming. Sorry, well, just give me two, sec two seconds for the mic. If you could say who you are as well, thanks. Right, uh, just a quick question. If uh, Mr. Michael can comment, what are those eight specific skills you just mentioned? Are there eight, sorry, there are eight domains? Excuse me, yeah. yeah. The eight domain areas, uh, data analytics being one, um, uh, robotics uh, is another one, uh, digital, the use of digital media, VR, AR is another one. Um, uh, you're testing my memory here. Uh, urban solutions is another one, so autonomous vehicles, uh, smart transportation, um, three or four other areas, but you know, do a quick Google, you, you see the eight areas, but it's not specific skills, it's domains of skills that is of financial services, fi FinTech and financial services being another one. Uh, so that's, those are the domains where we're seeing all these emerging skills becoming quite important. And uh, um, Roberto, I'll come back to you in a second, but one question for, 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 for Leslie, specifically from uh, Dr. Fahim Qureshi. Um, what are the pitfalls to look out for to avoid uh, when trying to bring university governments and industry on the same platform? It's often challenging enough to get university and industry together, but how do we get that magic uh, triple helix as it's often described? How do, how do we uh, avoid the pitfalls and, and provide what's required on all, all sides? So for me, it's patience. I think you can rush things. I think. If I think back, it took 20 years to move the UK's engineering and physical sciences portfolio from 5% collaborative to 54% collaborative with end users. Um, and during that journey, there were many bumps in the road. So I can remember when we just said, when applying for funding, please identify the beneficiaries of your research. And we had anarchy in the research community. <laughs> How dare anyone ask us who's going to benefit we're just doing good research. If you roll the clock forward to the 2014 um, research excellence framework when we had impact case studies, we had fantastic impact case studies from pure mathematics all over the place. Um, and in fact, I was talking to somebody last week in the UK who's just going to Hong Kong to explain to people in Hong Kong, academics in Hong Kong, that actually impact case studies were a great thing. It's actually built the confidence of the UK government to continue to invest in research. But patience is a real virtue. And that's a really difficult cadence to strike when you've got business that has short-term targets and universities who tend to work in three or four year projects because they have individuals doing PhDs or postdocs. So finding that understanding so you can get that cadence right is worth exploring. And don't always go for the big multi-million pound GSK center. Early little starts, an internship or a small industrial studentship project can be a great way of building up over time. But the one thing I would say, and I've learned the hard way, is patience is real virtual in trying to get this triple hel helix right. Let's reflect on that. Sorry, I'll come to you in a moment. Let's reflect on that a little bit briefly. The, the pitfalls, I think, you know, you do hear the, 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 the concerns from industry that 
Universities just act too slowly. You know, decisions go to committees, academic committees, they get debated. Things don't happen quickly enough. What, what are the other sort of things where the structures of universities can be a, a hindrance and that how we might be able to overcome them, whether universities need to rethink their decision-making processes, rethink uh, interaction with, with industry. Um, Roberta, you've obviously done a, a vast amount of work on the types of relationships that exist. Do you want to reflect a bit on the, on the pitfalls, but also the good models where we can see um, smooth, smooth relations and productive relations happening? What are the policies and procedures that support that? And what are the pitfalls that universities really need to avoid? Okay. So before, before that, just put in one what Leslie said. I love patience, but I think we need to speed up. Yeah, yeah, because of great. what? Yeah. Transformation and acceleration. Yeah. And let me do something different. Who of you have computer science, software development, courses, majors in your universities? Please raise, raise your hands if you have that. Software development, computer science, etc. Who of you believe that General Assembly, Coding Dojo, and similar initiatives are competitors of yours? Those are three month programs. And if I were if I had a third of the age that I have, I would be thinking about going to the university. And I would I would be seriously considering should I enroll in a four years computer science program or take a three months program, non degree, but for which companies are hiring based on my reputation on GitHub. That's very specific to the IT domain, but it's a, I think it's a reflect of acceleration. So patience and acceleration, I think there's this tension, right? And what Marcelo said, and once again, coming back to the conversations that we have involving industry and academia, we, we, we published another report, and the title is Speed and Leadership. And we, we had some industry leaders, and you can read this and you see my chairman also is the chairman of the board of Royal Dutch Shell, massive company, global footprint, someone who has been working in R&D for years. And his take was, and it's in the report, it's great to engage with the universities. It becomes m even more complex when we tackle complex problems that cut across university branches, different departments, different areas. So a challenge here when you need to speed up, it's at the same time we're tackling more and more complex problems. If we talk about SDGs, if we talk about water, if we talk about social issues, they're complex by their very nature. So they will require the engagement of different units from the university. One best practice that, one best practice that we have seen, curation. There are universities that are creating curators to help universities navigate their system. So, because, and this once again comes to this, if I have one problem, oh, I need to develop a new polymer. I go to the Department of Chemistry, okay. But if I need to put together different things, who would help me to navigate that complex system? So one best practice, curation. We've, we've been seeing universities doing that. Sure. Uh, we have two questions. If we take them both consecutively, please, we'll, we'll uh, have time. We have about 10 minutes left, so if you could be brief, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I am uh, Iram Suhail, and I'm from Government College University, Lahore, Pakistan. Um, it's, it's a loud thinking, I, and I, when I was uh, listening to the eminent speakers about the industry, academia, partnerships, and linkages, um, it was coming to my mind that uh, universities like ours, which is a general university, the um, the topic or the theme over here, industry partnerships in emerging markets, capitalizing on context. Um, I was thinking where uh, our social sciences and humanities fit in this context. That's my question, if any of you uh, would answer. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent, and can we just get the mic to the other gentleman and we'll take both of those questions. 
All right, Hi, uh, thank you for the panelists. Uh, and what a coincidence, I was touching the same point where um, most of the panelists, you, you've figured and you've you know, mentioned about the technical areas, especially when you talked about the skills and also for the um, industry and um, um, education win-win uh, uh, projects. But where is the social sciences and humanities? And uh, parallelly, we can mention also the, the public and private universities and how much it is different because you know, government is, is uh, heavily can uh, be supporting the public universities, but in, 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 in the uh, private universities, the industry itself will be uh, back in back uh, how the win-win project can be working on that. Thank you. Thank you. That, that fantastic question. I think, you know, we, we're entering the fourth industrial revolution. There's a real sense that we don't really know for sure what jobs look like in the future. We don't know how much automation how much robotics, how much artificial intelligence will take away existing jobs. So the, the, the actual skills that we need from our graduates, the skills that industry are going to require is a, a big, big question. Um, and I think that's really fascinating for me, that the sense that we have extremely rapid technological development, but actually without the humanities, without social sciences, those technological advancements could go awry or they could not realize their full potential, certainly when it comes to AI, how we actually understand our humanity. So can I ask the panel to reflect on that? What, what kind of teaching and learning do universities need to instigate? How do they need to do things differently to give you the skills that industry is going to need? What are they going to be demanding of young people uh, in the not too distant future? Perhaps, Michael, do you want to start with yeah, that? I can, I can start off. Um, first off, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, the Social Science and Humanities Foundation is critical for everyone, uh, be it students or the workforce. Uh, and that's because as we navigate increasingly complicated and complex uh, environments, if you are just educating on technical skills, uh, the individual would not maximize the, the ability to adapt and be resilient. So issues around problem solving, issues around uh, uh, you know, uh, dealing with complex situations, these are soft skills that is uh, critical. So in the skills training programs that we, we uh, design and deliver through the universities and through our private training organizations, uh, we've mapped out for different job roles the technical skills needed and what we call the uh, generic skills, transversal skills, soft skills. And that includes a good, good, uh, combi uh, good uh, proportion of social science uh, uh, related uh, type of skills, but also applying the Technology, the technical skills into different industry, industrial sectors requires understanding of that as well. So I think I'll, uh, I'll just say that uh, that's, those are all very important areas. When I talk about skills, it's not just hardcore skills, uh, but it's also the uh, soft skills and the transversal skills. A story my colleague uh, Billy Wong and the data team told when I was in Beijing recently is uh, you look at just one example of great technological advancement, um, automated cars, self-driving cars. But of course, that becomes a legal issue. Uh, there's a huge philosophical and ethical issue around the decision a car might make if it's in an accident scenario, in terms of whose life it might protect. There's a huge amount of moral and ethical and humanities aspects to some of these technological advancements. It's, I think, really interesting how we need to think about what, how we equip our young people. Leslie, do you want to come in on that yeah. question as well? So I think the role of social science and humanities is critically important. Um, I'll give you one example. Just before Christmas, Elsevier produced a report on AI in China, in Europe, and in the USA. Um, and one of the biggest wake-up calls out of that report was we looked at the media and how it covered AI. We looked at academic papers and how AI was covered, and we looked at societal and ethical issues. And uh, very, very few papers being published on the ethics and the responsible innovation of AI. Um, if we believe that research will find its way into society and for economic benefit, it isn't good enough to say, well, leave that to the social scientists or the ethicists. Um, we have to be better at tackling and thinking about these complex issues together. That means upskilling technical researchers, but it also means more team science and more team research. And 
countries that crack that, rather than the rather Victorian discipline base, will be, I believe, the countries that will be at the forefront of really address addressing the challenges of the 22nd century, because that's what universities should be thinking about now, not just the 21st century. So I think it's critically important, and I don't think that we've got that right yet. So I think it's really helpful those com comments were made. Yeah, thank you. So we only have, do you want to come back briefly, if we could get the mic? Uh, sorry, the, she's coming. Thanks. Um, sorry to bother you again, but uh, this thing is coming to my mind since morning when I was listening to AI over and over again. So I also put, put, put a question on Slido as well that can AI, is, uh, can AI replace the nurturing element which is given physically to the students or to the humans, where's the human touch? Uh, Roberto, would you like to come in? We only have two more minutes, but I'd, I'd like to get, get, get that question addressed and then leave, leave any rapid. I'm not sure if I'll, uh, I'm not, can you hear me? Is this working? Yeah, so I'm not sure if I'll answer your question, but I would be happy to explore that later. But one comment is that I personally believe that um, social skills are essential. When we talk about connecting with industry, um, there are, there's one very important trend that we've been seeing is for universities to leverage outside resources. What do I mean? If you are training people as entrepreneurs, it's great to have professors, but you need to have experienced entrepreneurs. If you're doing open innovation, as Marcelo said, and this is one of the best practices that we have captured, you need to bring industry in. You need to frame the conversation. You need to understand. You need to have a rapport. So I do not believe that AI will substitute people. It's very important. Social skills are essential. I think that importance is going up. And in order to in, really to implement some of the cutting edge practices, you need well-developed soft, soft skills. Yeah, just, just, just to, to add a little bit. So I, I work with analytics and advanced technology for the last 30 years. A, AI appeared in 50s. 1950s was the first time mm -hmm. artificial intelligence was brought to, to life. And that conversation always been there. And to be honest, I don't think uh, AI will be sustainable without the brain of a human being, right? You need to calibrate what AI is doing anyway, because there will be a learning process, but it's limited yet. So we still need to, to calibrate it. We need human being to be there and, and programming the artificial intelligence machine. That's number one. Number two, to finish, so I work for Ernest Young. It's, it's uh, probably most of you knows Ernest Young as the biggest audit firm, right? An audit is a very procedural process, right? To, to do an audit. And Ernest Young is using robots to do audit as we speak, right? And you can imagine thousands of people not being without jobs, but shifting their jobs. Yeah. We are not, you know, firing people because of the robots. We are finding new jobs for them to do. And I think that's what we need to think on the future. What is the job for the future? And it's great, just a little plug, actually, the, the first, well, one of the first panels of the afternoon is actually very much about machines and AI, so there's a great session on that later. Um, but we, we're right at the end of time, but Roberto, would you like to? Now, just a, a very short comment. Some of the things that I mentioned here in terms of best practices, you will find in the conference materials. There's a report that we actually created under the leadership of President Alderhan. So we reviewed university practices around the globe and captured some of those trends. So I want to really thank the Qatar University for their leadership in our organization in this process and share the information with you. And also I think we can share the resources. You know, we'll be sharing the, the session videos and content. We're reporting on all these sessions, but actually we can put some resources together as well to make sure that there's uh, more takeaways from this session. It's been a, a fantastic conversation. As ever, an hour seems far too short. We had so many uh, great issues to, to really skim the surface of, but uh, my takeaway lesson is the, uh, the power of partnership, of sensitivity, of uh, patience, um, and being open to 
new ideas, new cultures, that's whether that's cultures across geographies, cultures between business and academia. Uh, there's been some fun, fantastic stories and some fantastic lessons. So uh, it's lunchtime. If you could just thank the panel for their contribution, and we'll take a break. Thank you.